Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our meetup. Hope you, hope you are fine, people joining. Welcome. Let's give people some time to join. Welcome. If you're using the chat, please make sure to, in the drop down, to select send to all, because otherwise you're just chatting, chatting with the hosts. Hi from Berlin. Yeah, let us know in the chat where you are joining us from. Portugal, Stuttgart, Denver, India, Zurich. Oh, so, so many people in the chat. It's hard to read. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my God. So cool. Czech Republic, Turkey. Oh, wow. So we are, I'm streaming live from Munich, Germany. And with me, I have my co host, my wonderful co host, Andresa. Andresa, where are you today? I am in Dublin, Ireland. Awesome. Yeah, lots of people. So great to see you. Lots of folks yes. joining already. Berlin, Armenia, US. Wow, that's so amazing. San Francisco, Ukraine, welcome. Awesome. So we will give Slovakia, we will give people some time to join before we kick this off. I'm super excited to talk about automation, automation of design systems, um, because I've been looking into this topic for a long time, for at least two years. And I was, I was wondering, when will this topic finally become popular? When will we have a plugin that can out automate uh, component creation or rename layers or something like that? So um, two years ago, I even organized a design systems hackathon, and I was hoping that somebody is going to create a plugin to automate component creation or something like that. But unfortunately, it did not happen back then. <laughs> <laughs> So, but now with chat GPT and mind journey automation, the topic really, really skyrocketed. That's so cool. I know it's amazing. Um, yeah, looking forward to that component automation for sure. <laughs> and other yes. automations to come. Yeah. There are still people joining from Norway, New York. Let's give them another minute and then we'll kick this off. We also have a Miro board. We'll post uh, uh, the link in the chat. Let's do it right now. Copy board link. Um, I hope this works for you. I will post it multiple times in the chat so you can see it. Okay, so we have more than 300 people in this call. That's Amazing, really, so cool. Okay, let's kick it off. So welcome everyone to our uh, to our meetup. I'm Sylvia, the founder of Into Design Systems. Into Design Systems is a design systems community and conference. We invite people, cool folks from the community to share um, their design systems knowledge. Um, our content is usually very practical, hands-on, and I would say also future proof. So we have we have witnessed the launch of Figma tokens now called Token Studio during our conference. So that's the content we are looking for. We are looking for people who who push the design systems topic forward. Um, so we can learn from them. We want to see how their day to day life uh, looks like as a design system lead or a design systems designer. So we can learn from them and people can take like something out of this and implement it in their day-to-day uh, -day work. That's from my side, Andresa. Amazing. Um, yeah, so for me, for, for one, I'm a big fan of Intel Design Systems and I love all the resources. Um, I also teach Design Systems with Memorizely. And I'm also part of the design system team, a teamwork. So um, big design system enthusiast, if you will. <laughs> um, yeah, super excited. Well, I was, this is my second time hosting this event. Uh, last time was a lot of fun. So I'm really looking forward to today as well. Yes, Memorizely is doing like 
I always see these uh, short clips on LinkedIn. You're doing such an amazing job, uh, job with your tutorials. Um, so there's this um, three Figma tips or how to create a button super fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah really cool. <laughs> those are a lot of fun, actually. Um, looks easier than it is to record them, but it's so great to see all the feedback afterwards. You know, you know folks that then think of uh, creating something that way I think my favorite ones are around um, animation and yeah design system resourcing as well yes awesome so um let us share the mural board um oh, we have close to close to 400 now Nice. So hopefully you can see the mirror board now because we want to keep our meetup and conference interactive. So we want you to be part of this. Um, you can follow me in the mirror board, Miro board. How, how do you pronounce Miro? Do you say Miro, Miro, Miro? <laughs> yes. I, lo I love the way you say it with the accent. Um, I say Miro, but I don't know. I, I don't know okay. what the correct <laughs> way is. <laughs> I think nobody knows uh, what the correct <laughs> way is to pronounce it. But we have this fantastic Miro board. Um, let's start in the top left. You can read about interdesign systems and ourselves, connect with us on LinkedIn if you're interested. And then we have our networking wall. Um, I'm not sure why it is gray. I, I hope uh, everything still works. It's always with this whiteboard. Um, should be locked, but people still find a way to move it. <laughs> so this is our world map. So find your location and leave a comment by hitting C. Um, I'm somewhere here. Oh, there are so many, so many people. Um, I'm probably here somewhere in Munich and leave some, some facts about yourself, your name, maybe a LinkedIn, something, uh, maybe a fun fact about yourself. Do you have a fun fact, um, Andresa? What, what is something like you would like to share about yourself? <laughs> Fun fact, not so fun. Um, okay, maybe last time I shared the fact that I got my first tattoo when I was twelve. Um, today maybe I'll talk about my first. Um, uh, well, when I was for my first year as a designer, I created an infographic. That's a many years ago. Um, about what like strange or bizarre things that people forget in the public transport. And um, that's in Ireland. And the top one was actually a cardboard cardboard cutout of Niall Rogers. Um, if you know, he's a famous music producer, he produced uh, Madonna, Daft Punk. Um, mm -hmm. And he, he somehow found out about that, about him being number one <laughs> bizarre thing that people forgot in the public transport. And he retweeted uh, the infographic, which was really cool amazing that's really funny and as i can see somebody already moved the world map and we fucked up things but it is how it is um i will try to lock it again <laughs> and, uh, a fun fact about myself you can see it probably in the background it's i have the sketch uh, a poster from sketch <laughs> it has been hanging there for about four years or something <laughs> back then when sketch was cool <laughs> so it's this yellow one i got from sketch <laughs> um yeah so the mirror board is going crazy we'll somehow manage to to uh, move the world map in the right direction again don't worry about that um but it's a good good time to remind you about uh, our you of our code of contact, uh, conduct. So um, please don't spam the chat, <laughs> don't spam the mirror board, don't uh, post any uh, I don't know naked photos of yourself <laughs> in the mirror board or anything like that. Be nice to each other. That will be cool. Um, so let's move to the next board. We have an icebreaker for this session. And uh, yes. Sorry, no, I was just going to say fun. I love icebreakers. <laughs> okay. 
So this time we want to know if you had the power to automate something, uh, what would it be? What would it be for you, Andresa? If you could automate something, it could be something personal or like design code. Right. In my life, I would definitely automate folding clothes. I think it's, I spend just too much time doing that and it's my least favorite thing to do. So if there is a way of automating, I'm sure there there is already, but I mean, more realistic that everyone can access. So yeah, it would be folding clothes. What about you? Yeah, that would be awesome. I always wanted to automate the creation of components in Figma. So the fun story is that I used to be a freelance design systems lead or design systems designer. And I did probably more than 20 migrations from Adobe XD or Sketch to Figma. And I wow. got really burned out and tired of creating the same components over and over again for, for different clients. And if you look at the skeleton of a component, it's basically, they were almost the same always. There was just sure. a lot of star styling. So now with um, Token Studio, we can at least manage the styling. But we're also going to launch a kit or show you a Figma UI kit, a headless UI kit tonight, which really helps with um, automation. So yes, automating the um, creation of components. That's what nice. I wanted for the last three years and I begged <laughs> for it. I even organized a hackathon, but nobody created this fucking plugin. But tonight <laughs> is the night where we will launch a really cool kit. Amazing. I had a, a quick preview of it. It's very exciting. Yes. So we also want to know like the topics you are interested in. Uh, feel free to explore the mule board on your own. Um, there's also a networking wall and you can post some resources, leave us some feedback. And maybe before we kick off um, the talks, uh, I would like to highlight our upcoming events. So we will do an in-person meetup in Munich at BMW. Um, we will have BMW speaking. Uh, we will have Jan Six from Token Studio speaking, and we have uh, Marco Krenz speaking. It will be an amazing meetup. And we will do another in-person meetup uh, at Salones in Madrid, in Spain. Can't wait, can't wait for the tapas, you know, patat patata bras. Not sure if they're called like that. Those are my <laughs> favorites. <laughs> I'll eat them for breakfast, lunch, uh, all day. Oh. And in Madrid, we will have the folks from Salonis presenting their design system. We will have Mr. Biscuit in person presenting the unstyled kit, which we will show you tonight as well. Um, so if you want to meet Mr. Biscuit, he's a very famous plug-in maker. And I'm really sorry about the new board, um, but there's nothing we can do about it. Um, so Mr. Biscuit, and we might have some some people from Panpot. You know Panpot, the new design tool? Yeah. Join yeah. as well. They are based in Madrid, and hopefully they will join us and present something as well. That would be really cool. So feel free so to cool. check out the in-person events. There is an Eventbrite link, and we'll do a big conference. So the future of design systems is coming back this summer. We will we will publish and release it in the upcoming days. It will be a three days conference, two days of talks, hands-on practical talks, and one full day of workshops. So if you like this meetup, this vibe, this kind of content, you will for sure love the conference. Um, so make sure to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, that's where we'll, where we will announce this conference. Someone is asking if that will be online too, Sylvia. Oh yes, the conference will be online, fully online, online only. Um, the meetups will be in person, but for the conference, you want like as many people as possible to join because we are going to show some really cool stuff, some future-proof stuff. So Jan Six will be there again 
to showcase some really cool stuff they've been working on for Token Studio. Um, we'll have some amazing speakers. So yes, it will be online. Okay, so before we start with the first talk, I just want to mention that our kit, the headless design system kit, boilerplate, uh, just let me lock it. Um, we have launched it today on Product Hunt, and it would mean the world to us if you could help us with an upvote, because we put a lot of work and effort into this. You will see how this kit works in the second talk. And there's also a code. Um, you can get 50% off for the kits. So during the meetup, this is also our launch party. So please go to Product Hunt and help us with an upvote. All right, so with that, I would say it's time for our first talk. I will stop sharing my screen in a second. Our first talk is Design Systems or Design Automation Next Level by Thorsten Jankowski. I will stop the presentation. Thorsten, are you with us in this call? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hey, Dawson, Hi. welcome. Hi. Great to Hi, see everyone. you again. Uh, 460 people or 16 people. All right. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Are you scared? <laughs> Never. No. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Why should I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to see you again because the last time you spoke at our conference, which was in May. In May 2022, like mm -hmm. a year ago, more yeah, than a year eight, ago, eight, almost months, a year ago. Yeah, months, eight, yeah. nine months. And back then, automation was not even like a topic. Nobody was interested in that. And see now. There was, <laughs> yeah, there was <laughs> no chat GPT. There was no oh, mind yeah. journey. Nobody gave a fuck about automation. Yeah. I really tried people to convince to create some plugins or something. But you may, you've made some really cool predictions. Yeah, what is let, let, probably let, going let, to let, happen? And, and see where we are now. Yes. Some of them really became reality. That's why I was thinking Dawson is the perfect speaker for this meetup. And I can't wait to... Just one fun fact. Or what if you had the power to automate something, Thorsten? What would yeah, it be? I I, I I put it on the board um, and I said uh, I would automate pet feeding because uh, uh, my, my cats are very hungry and I have to go uh, three times, four times a day um, um, because if they are hungry, they are standing here at my desk and, and, and uh, um, I'm uh, stealing my nerves, you know, <laughs> <clears throat> sitting on my keyboard and, and, and such things. And if I would have the possibility to, to automate that, <laughs> then um, my life would be easier. Awesome. Love it. Okay, Dawson. The floor, the stage is yours. Feel okay. Free to take over. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with our community. Enjoy. Yeah, you're so welcome. Um, and um, yeah, as I said, uh, well, as I, as I have spoken um, last year about um, uh, this, the future of design systems and meaning of, of automation, um, um, I also have something in this uh, way today because I'm, I'm repeating some things. Uh, but what I learned from that is, and I will come to that, is how to organize and how to optimize design system operations. Yeah. So, so oh. what's the important thing, um, uh, or from my point of view, to bring it to life? And now I have to see if I can share my screen here. What is that? I cannot share my screen. So, how many private? <clears throat> Ah, okay. This is that, and then I'm looking for keynote. Where's my keynote window? Just a second. Yeah, feel free to take your time. Here it is. So, and now awesome. I'm getting into full, <clears throat> full mode. Do you see my whole window? Or yes, do you see my, my, my notes uh, on 
No, we just see the slide. Welcome to Great. Design System so, Operations. Okay, let me start. So uh, welcome again, all the 422 people out there and thanks for your, your thumbs. Um, so I will uh, talk a bit about myself and about design system operations. And um, I'm starting with uh, the future of design oh, systems. No, it's design integration. Yeah, so how to uh, integrate design into your workflows and into your organization, in, into your products, I would say. Um, and in the end, it's the future of design. So, um, and it's highly subjective. So it's the future of design as I am seeing it. So as Torsten sees it and uh, a little bit on, on myself. So I'm uh, an industrial designer. Uh, I studied in the 19s, uh, 90s, um, and, and really the, 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 the core thing of uh, industrial design, <laughs> product design. And today, this is very new. I'm uh, the lead design systems operations uh, at GEO. This is an Indian company, and I just started officially uh, tomorrow, not today. <laughs> I left my, my old job today. Um, so I'm a, I'm a collaboration evangelist, I'm a holocrat, I'm also always thinking holacracy in a holacracy way, uh, on a strategic way, and I'm a lecturer such as here and such as at the university in, uh, in Hildesheim. Um, I'm a husband, father of two sons, windsurfer, uh, living in Braunschweig, Germany, and have two, two, uh, two cats and a dog. Um, let's start to the topic, the future of design as I am seeing it, which is, again, highly subjective. Um, welcome to the future. So again, like last year, we had that. Uh, I'm asking the state of design. So where are we and where are we going? Um, last year, I said UX has entered the building. Uh, today, I'm saying AI has entered the design building. This is a little difference. So um, design is uh, still increasing uh, in the industry out there. Uh, we continue to play an important role. So don't worry about AI. So uh, we are still here and we will stay. Um, and all of us are reaching the next maturity level in our organization. So um, last year I said, uh, according to this, uh, to this maturity level, uh, and later letter uh, that all of us is seeing themselves on stage five of six. So six you never reach, but but any of us is is thinking we are on five. And the truth last last year was or my reception was last year we were on two to three. Uh, now I see a little bit of a of an increasement. So we are on three to four, but it's still not where we would like to be. Um, so it's just a way to go. Um, but let us say the UX and design is in the building and it, it won't go away. So we will stay. We as designers are playing a better, better and more important role than before. So it's getting better for us. Uh, the, the times of the endless um, evangelism is, is um, over and we can we can produce and we can uh, um, go into production. Um, but the biggest pitfall in this is the collaboration. From my point of view, this is highly subjective. Um, so the collaboration and focus today is seeing us as the designers and them. Um, yeah, this could be the business departments. This could be the developers. That could be the, the clients. This could be them. Yeah, let's say. So from understanding to, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. From understanding to uh, exploring. And on a big scale and big ecosystems, um, uh, this is even more um, uh, dramatic because you have this us and them in the, in the product teams, in your silos, and the silos themselves are not connected to each other. So you have you are facing, and many of you know this, you're facing double work, you're facing intransparency, you're facing 
several, uh, several interests. Um, you are facing several tools, not one tool or, or one streamlined way to work. Um, you are seeing a lack of knowledge management um, and a lot of not invented here syndromes. So you, you, you know all of this and you, you name it. There are many, many other problems you are facing. And normally you should be like this, us together, working together one goal where the focus is um, uh, in, a, in, a, in, in, a, in the same way from understanding to exploring to materialize and you always have the same ratio um, working together in one team. And on a bigger uh, scale and big ecosystems, you uh, would like to have those silos connected to each other's working hand in hand. Uh, everyone is on the same page and uh, everyone is working together in trust. Um, and on top of that, someone is or something is bringing it all together, orchestrating the chaos uh, actually, uh, design ops is in that role or operations or execution, you can call it kindergarten or you name it. So um, this is um, a good image of where we would like to go in big ecosystems. So what is the state of design? Is it to cry? Um, but I can say relax because there's hope. Yeah, there's always hope. <clears throat> um, and uh, to understand the, the hope, let's say, or let's, let's look, where are we now? So as I said, design has come to stay. Um, many efforts are going into design system creations. As I said last year, I'm still saying that. Um, so if you know in the scene you're, you're in, anyone not talking about, about design systems, then this should be uh, an, a unicorn because everyone is talking about design systems and actually is doing design systems. Um, UI tools and work chains are set. So Figma, yay, we have it in the, in the biggest uh, uh, bandwidth. And now something like Token Studio, we have it in means of tokenization, yay, yay. Um, so things are getting better and more Im implemented in the companies. Um, design systems we're, uh, are set now. So no one is doubting that the design system is relevant. Also, components like li component libraries are set, um, but as you see, component libraries in Figma and component libraries in Code are someone somehow similar. So some of us are doing the same same thing. Again, the siloed uh, thing is a is a good image on that. <laughs> Design token technologies is here. No one's doubting it. Um, it's just about the scale. So if we are talking now about multi-brand design systems or multi-brand uh, or hyper multi-brand design systems and uh, techno technology agnostic implementation. So implementation without saying, okay, I have a React library or an Angular library, but it's totally fluid. So this is what I'm saying about the scale. So, um, so token technologies are there. We are just not there when it comes to implementation in design and in code. Um, we are starting here, I would say. Um, design to code pipelines still are coming. So um, if you don't know the name Mitosis, then Google it. Um, it could be relevant for you. And um, and microservices and micro front end architecture is they have a breakthrough through um, due to the business needs. So you also should get familiar with uh, this concept of microservices in the technology. Um, if this is getting more and more important if you are thinking uh, about big ecosystems. Yeah. And if you have a, a, a no clue what microservices and micro front ends are, just ask chat GTP, it could answer that. So, oops, ah, so chat GTP. Um, so if you have heard what I said last year, so, so um, um, UX and um, front end uh, design and front end development will be automated. So if you have still any doubts seeing uh, uh, chat GTP, 
uh, and the abilities and the and the power it has, then just try it out. So so I this afternoon I, I asked Chat GPT, can you write a UX documentation for a button component, for example? And here it is. So it's not perfect. We can uh, make it better, and uh, it also can code, and it can code better. But it's here. It's in the house, and it won't go go, go away. So be prepared that uh, AI will will take more and more of the standard work of of designers. You know? um, again. We are using the same tools. We are sharing the same idea. We are building the same components. We are applying similar semantics. We are using similar technologies, building upon similar architectures. We are designing for related use cases, implementing design individually. AI is here. And so, so we are doing craftsmanship, really? Why? So in many cases, I can see Design still is craftsmanship like this. So, so carpenters building a, a, a desk, for example, and the next desk is again handmade. Um, so it's time for automation. This is not to be meant in handwork, uh, this work. This is meant to be, yeah, um, um, production line work, at least the front end uh creation and it, if it comes to to the processes we are facing between designers under designers within design and within uh, product teams um i see processes maybe a little bit like this so should our processes be smooth like this or should they be more like this and a little bit more fun um so this brings me to the question, what's around us? Um, from design discipline to what's happening in the outside world, yeah? So, so let's, let's move on to, to see what's around us. So again, AI, AI, growing, increasing AI. So this will, this will help us as a designer on the one hand, and free us from the from the redundant work and from the uh, non-creative work, let's say. So the standards will do an uh, AI, and also on a data-driven, um, on a data um, uh, uh, point of view, AI will will tell us how to craft um, applications, how to integrate functions, how to integrate user needs and so on. This will be automated. Um, low code, just consider that um, things have don't have to be built again and again. So low code is here, low code is increasing. And um, if you are combining AI, automated design systems and low code, then you are similar to um, um, yeah, similar to or, or very close to to um, um, yeah, an automated machine doing design work into the real application. Um, what's around us? So, so I I named it before. So, if you don't know mitosis, then have a look what it is. So, automated pipelines from design to real reusable code, no means of what technology in the future. So, mitosis is not perfect, but it's a beginning. Um, yeah, you can have different opinions on the tool itself, but think about the possibility you have using such a tool. And the other thing is, if you're thinking it till the end, so you have tokens, you have a pipeline, you have um, you have technology in place, then uh, who needs Figma anymore? So prototyping code with the real components, with the real design, and do code first uh, without using Figma in two years, maybe. So maybe they have an answer on that. Maybe not, I don't know. But if you are bringing it all together, um, again, yeah. So the left hand uh, arguments were we are using the same tools, same ideas, same components, similar to semantics, technology, and so on. And if you're putting it to AI, low code, standard solutions, automation, libraries, code first, then you all end up here. This is the automation 
pipeline and the design automation. Yeah. But then if you are fearing or are in fear of this um, perspective, let's ask what de determines a brand. What's important in design? Yeah. So design in focus on focus on design. So which part of design is the most important in the long run? So how much UX is in UI? Mm, more, we should set more focus on UX than on UI because UI is a redundant thing and it is highly standardized and UX is more about the experience of the customers. And the most important thing is to make our customers happy and not our front-end developers. Yeah, they should also be happy. But but uh, in the end, the, the goal is to, to reach higher customer experience uh, and raise the design quality, or in German, as we say, Gestaltungsqualität, which is a nice word. Um, so this brings me to the question on which part of the design we should focus on. Uh, should we invest on in your of our should we invest our time in pixel perfection? Or should we invest our time into process quality? Um, what really makes users smile? The pixel perfection or the process quality? Mm. This is an open question, but I would say it would make users happy if we would um, invest a little bit more in process quality. But the designers maybe are not convinced. So coming now to the part of how to collaborate in the right way. So I will not give you an introduction. So I will, I will tell you a bit of a thing um, about agility, but I won't give, give you a comprehensive um, insight in agile, in agile works or agile workflows. You know that thing, but I will connect the dots together. So how to collab collaborate the right way? Let's see how to do it in the wrong way. So turn it around and uh, see how can we make collaboration very wrong. And um, this is a very funny thing. So I, I, uh, um, I was given this here um, some, some days ago and I thought, oh, this, I, I have to build it in my presentation. So this, uh, a web page, corporaterebels.com, uh, with a with an article with a web page on the on an advice from the CIA how to sabotage your workplace. So this is very old from 1944 and go went into the direction of um, of Germans um, to to sabotage their workplace to hinder the, 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 the Germans um, to, um, to, uh, um, yeah, to further um, distract uh, Europe yeah, in the war. Um, so and if you are going into that, this is very funny. So you have many, uh, this is a, 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 a smaller book um, which has some, some nice, uh, um, nice insights. And so, for example, they put together the five most important things from that, oh, sorry, from that page. So how to collaborate the wrong way. So talk as frequently as possible and at great length. Second, bring up irrelevant issues as frequently as possible. Third, haggle over precise wordings of communications, minutes, and resolutions refer back to matters decided upon and be worried about the proper propriety of any decisions. You may know this. Uh, maybe you heard of that. Uh, maybe you experienced that. Um, um, but yeah, you can come back. This is invented by the CIA. So second page. So uh, again, uh, 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 comprehension. So Top five ways to avoid poor management. So misunderstand orders, ask endless questions or engage in long correspondence about such orders. In making work assignments, always sign out the unimportant job first. Insist of perfect work in relatively unimportant products. Hold conferences when there's more critical work to be done. 
multiply the procedure and clearances involved in issuing instructions. So you may also have faced that. And the third example is office workers. Um, again, uh, a, a page with many, uh, many uh, instructions. And now, once again, five top uh, uh, issues. Tell important callers the boss is busy or talking on another telephone. Spread disturbing rumors that sound like inside dope. Work slowly. Think out ways to increase the number of movements necessary on your job. Contrive as many interruptions to your work as you can. When you go to the laboratory, spend longer time than is necessary. Do your work poorly and blame it on bad tools, machinery, <laughs> or equipment. So I think we have heard of that. So this is from 1944 by the CIA on how to sabotage your, your workplace. Mm, think about it. So is modern workplace simply sabotage? You could ask that. So coming to the how to do better. Let's do better all together. Um, first, design ops. Bring design ops into place. So uh, design ops, if you don't have heard, because you are too much uh, and too deep into design systems, design ops is a framework, and design ops is design operations, so the operation of design. Um, and it has two, three dimensions. So the first is work together work, get work done, and create impact is the, is the third one. And uh, work together has three columns, organize, collaborate, humanize, get work done is standardize, harmonize, and prioritize, create impact is measure, socialize, and enable. I didn't invent that. I got it from uh, the Nielsen Norman group, but I made my additions, which you can see now. So. If it comes to work together, <clears throat> the first aspect is organized. So how to construct and how to structure teams, how to build the right team. This may include design organizational structure for, and Nielsen Norman was saying design uh, teams. Um, and I'm saying, no, it's not about design teams. It's designing organizational structure for cross-functional teams because you will not work in an island. Create, <clears throat> sorry, create contemporary skill complete holistic teams, not only design teams. Define both the role of individual designers and the role of design department as a, as a whole, but also the role of the designer in a cross functional team. So, what does the role mean in a, in a cross functional team? Is he just the, 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 the guy or the, the, the lady? Who makes it nice for or, or, or writing down the the um, the user requirements for the for the developers? No, it's an integral part of the functional team. Um, define the collaboration between product owners, product managers, developers, and designers. It's so important. So this is also not featured in the Nielsen Norman group. You have to define the collaboration model, the communication the roles and everything around the collaboration. And this is one uh, from my, my latest experiences, respect cultural aspects. So, uh, and also, yep, you, you, you should appreciate if you could work or you have the, the ability to work in a, in a multicultural environment because you are learning so much. This is so great. So coming to work together, collaboration, how to create effective communication. This could include define a structure for regular rituals. And this is also new to Niels and Norman agile meetings. So I cannot imagine any design meetings without being agile. Ensuring that group spaces and also nowadays we work remote, remote environments are con conductive and collaboration, uh, co collaborative and the conductive to collaboration. Establish communities of practice for skills and interest sharing. So this is a core thing to, to enable collaboration. 
The third thing of working together is the humanizing factor. So how can we ensure that hiring, onboarding and professional development practices treat employees like humans first and not like machines? This could encompass, and this is going uh, to the audience because I, I think we have some of our uh, colleagues out there. So if you are thinking um, about onboarding, <laughs> um, so first thing is designing interviewing practices that are specific to the needs um, of the design team, not following management opinions. Yeah, so the needs of the design team. Um, build trust with your management. You are the expert on design. You should also be expert for designers and for, for, for hiring people. Yeah? Um, be transparent on your processes. So nothing is more annoying than if you don't know what comes tomorrow. Yeah? So, um, and if, if you hire someone and the, the to be hired uh, people, uh, uh, person, has to ask, hey, could you give me a feedback where we are in the process? And this is annoying. So, so give every time transparency, uh, every two, two days, or if you have news, then give feedback. Um, and also is establishing consisting hiring and onboarding practices to set up new team members for success. Onboarding is the most important word here. Standardizing transparent career pathways for both management and non-management roles. This is something for next year because uh, now we are talking about hiring. Next year we are talking about uh, um, yeah, pathways maybe. Um, <clears throat> next aspect, get, get work done, standardize. How to facilitate design quality through consistent tool set and processes. This might cover documenting and optimizing the high level design process from initiation through te testing and to develop, uh, de delivery, defining and aligning purposeful uh, design activities within the design process, auditing and enforcing the use of the same design tools for efficient collaboration. So nothing is more annoying than, um, than you know that. Uh, so so, so some, some people are working in Sketch, some in, in XD, some in Figma, um, some are documenting it in, in Jira and, um, and in um, um, Confluence and the other ones in, in SharePoint or whatever. Um, do you use a testing with yourself? Yeah, so with yourself, it's just, service design, the whole process is service design, you can test that. Um, iterate until you reach perfection, also for pro processes, not only for, for products. And no process is made out of uh, reinforced concrete. Yeah, so it should iterate. Um, the next aspect, harmonize, how to share and expand design intelligence uh, to work uh, from the same shared um, understanding. Um, and build a common ground. Scaling and managing design systems to create efficiencies for designers. You all know that this is a low brainer, yeah? Onboard, train and support everyone. Design is only as good as it's implemented. This is important and this is a hard thing from my point of view. So if you are building a design system, don't be so ignorant to think that everyone is understanding what you're doing. You have to onboard people, you have to train, you have to support. And in the end, you would like them to, to use your design system in your intent, yeah? So you have to care also your, your clients. So designers and, and front-end developers are your clients and the clients of your clients are the, the end clients. So um, design is only as good as it's in, implemented and it's your role as a contributor of a design system to make it as seamless as, 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 it's, as possible, yeah? So build repositories of user research data that is accessible to everyone. This is also an, an ongoing effort. And maybe next year we can say, oh, we have some, we have made some progressions and we have user research above all the company. Um, so now, nowadays it's, it's mostly uh, hidden in, in personal repositories in, in I don't know where. Be transparent. 
design uh, guidelines are made to use, not to hide. So I, I, I experienced this many ways that um, uh, departments are saying, oh no, this is my design guidelines. I only give it away to my, my employees, my 10 employees. And all the rest out there is building redundant uh, guidelines. In the end, you will have 55 uh, design guidelines telling the same stuff, um, a little bit different. And this, uh, the 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 uh, effect in the end is that you have 55 implemented designs out there. So be transparent. This is only a guideline, and this is not um, this is not th something for to to hide. Um, so prioritizing, how to get work done, prioritize. So how, how can we make decisions about what projects to work on, what components to work on, what functions to work on, and when to work on them, yeah? First or second or third. Um, this may consist, create a high level roadmap. I have to smile on that because that was my job um, the, the last days. Do a vision, mission, action break, breakdown. So come from a vision. If you would like to go to Mars, yeah, to, to, to ask yourself what is to be done to go to Mars and put it in a timeline where you're saying, okay, first I have to build my rocket. So, or the, the, the rocket fuel, get the rocket fuel or whatever. Plan with all team members, not with yourself. Create a shared and transparent backlog so everyone is on the same page. This is getting into the, the area of agile work. And you, you are seeing so how close we as designers are to this agile thinking. So it belongs together. If you have one team of, if you are one team of many teams, think about scaled agile frameworks. Do a joint planning, yeah? Do it together, reach together a goal. Um, uncovering and exposing bottlenecks in your design workflow. So what hinders you is to be is to be eliminated and to be optimized. So and again, you're understanding not only design teams, so understanding product team capacity in order to accurately estimate and allocate projects together holistically, and using ob objective and consistent methods to prioritize features or product projects. So this goes into, again, agile functionalities. So now we are coming to, well, I think this is double. Yep. OK. So we are com coming to the measurement point. So get work done, measure it. So if you, if you are into design, you would also like to know what's your impact, yeah. So, um, what is um, what is the, the the important thing of your job? And without measuring it, you will never know that. Uh, without doing user interviews, you will never know that. Uh, without creating definitions of good and done for cross-functional teams, you will never know that. Choosing and aligning um, metrics for design quality and tracking those metrics over time. So in, in, install a KPI system, whatever that may include. Um, so analytics or inserts or, I don't know, questions on Teams, questions on Slack, uh, the time answered uh, um, um, from, from, a, from, a, from an incident or, or support question until the re re resolving uh, feature, or you have a request for a new functionality in your your component, and um, the time until it's implemented and shipped. Uh, these are KPIs you could implement. Um, create and uh, use uh, design principles throughout the design process as our objective measures. Yeah, you could always in the implemented uh, application ask: Is the design principle uh, uh, respected? Yeah, is, is it built in? Um, and take serious what you do. It's a professional discipline. Don't, don't get, um, uh, get told that you are making it nice. The, this is the old thing. Let yourself also measure professionally and use for measuring. This is perfect. Use AI for that. <laughs> it can, can tell you so much about usage. Um, socialize. So we only have one left, I think. So how to educate others in the role and value of design. 
uh, crafting a consistent message of the role and value of design and proactively share that message to other partners, not only design partners, and to your team members also. Capturing and sharing success stories of user-centered design processes. Yeah, the, wh where's good product adoption of your components? Where is good customer experience using your components in which products and why? Um, analyze that and, and build on that. Yeah, this is strengthen you and strengthen your, your argumentation to use and to, to spread a good design system in place. And also good design. Uh, recognize and reward teams that apply design practices to their work. You can simply do this uh, if you um, establish a mm, yeah, design community, do a show and tell from time to time, and then you reward those who are, are implementing your design correctly or design correctly by by giving them a hand or or telling them your 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 management or putting a um a, a newsletter together or whatever just tell them uh, give them a bit of a fame and uh, fame is always good because it builds friends and partner with the management and the product teams yeah design is not paying itself customers do yeah so waiting for someone paying a team for a design system is wrong um, you should go into the adoption part and see where your design can make a difference. Yeah. So, so go to the product teams where it hurts that they don't have a design system. Ask they if you can contribute on them, partner with them, listen to them, get their requirements and help them. Yeah. By helping them, you help the customers, you get paid. Last thing I think is enablement. So how to cultivate the understanding and the use of design activities, even those outside. Educating and not people outside the, the design uh, system team, simply everyone in the organization on how to use design tools and activities in a target specific way. So I'm not telling that you should um, train or, or um, educate everyone in the same way uh, with uh, with uh, design um, um, crafting in Figma, for example. But so, for example, a product owner needs to know how to work with you as a design system team together um, on a different way than the product manager, than the designer, than the developer, than the whole product team, than the manager. Yeah. So everyone has a specific uh, message to 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 get or to receive. Pre, uh, creating accessible design activity playbooks to avoid the design team as a bottleneck challenge. Yeah? So, so making everyone out there um, able to work with your tools, with your, uh, with your product, with your uh, components, whatever. Yeah, giving them a, hand, a, a playbook where they can, which they can use to craft them, themselves with uh, your your help. Implementing skill training to ensure that activities are understood and used appropriately and document what you are doing. Video helps, by the way. Um, coming back, this is the whole picture again. So design ops is the, the, the triage of uh, work together, work, get work done, create impact and has the aspects of organizing, collaboration, humanizing, standardizing, harmonizing, prioritizing, measurement, socialize, and enablement. So you can find that very in a very good way on the Nielsen Norman group. I, I put the link here and I will, can I can put it on my my Miro um, board later on. So second, and this will uh, not take too long. So I'm through with it in, in a few minutes. Second is do agile, do cross-functional, do cross or intercultural. Um, appreciate that. Don't close yourself or, or, or lock yourself up in the design team. Work with the outer world. No one is an island and neither is design. So design is a uh, team sport, as I'm saying. Um, and you have probably, you have to face this. <laughs> you have to work with those guys. Um, 
and uh, also what helps is learn psychology yeah learn what your vice versa partner teammate business department uh, uh, colleague is 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 feeling is thinking what's their need yeah what's their pain also and uh, try to find out the motivation for their behavior so learn psychology a little bit at least so this also helps and i can tell you this is super great learn cultural character characteristics try to understand the um the 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 perspective of the others um so i can i can tell you this is a super super great uh journey i'm on there uh where what and i'm super happy i decided to go that way uh to throw my myself in after 20 years in a german super tanker company uh into something new this is really it it, it keeps you young and uh it it keeps your uh your your mind uh active um you you don't get bored and it's super super interesting um this is also something uh don't don't confrontate always try to work toward consensus yeah try to find a solution um and the the solution mostly is found by psychology try to understand what your your vice versa is thinking why you don't have the same opinion try to find on a middle ground um, and try to find a a compromise you yeah? know nowadays so so if you are thinking about politics this could be also a good help um work together and in the end play together this is fun yeah so if you are play, getting into this play mode, then it's the most <clears throat> uh, the most rewarding uh, benefit you will ever get. So any of this unthinkable, so new ways of working, agile ways, unthinkable, is this a horror vision? Uh, so so if you are thinking about AI and new component libraries which are fully automated, is this a horror vision? I told you last year exactly the same sentence no hell no all of this all the automation all the agile work was will give us as a designer more freedom to focus on what really matters and really matters what really matters is smiling users this is what we all should achieve smiling users anywhere you are thinking um so this is it um i'm through with my with my talk um so in the end we would like to have smiling users and uh, you can contact me on linkedin um and you can contact me also via gmail on my private mail address and uh, by the way we are hiring so thank you thank awesome. you dawson amazing presentation another legendary presentation by Thorsten <laughs> please give a round of applause to Thorsten in the chat by posting your favorite emoji <laughs> really really cool talk yeah thank you this is your applause Thorsten <laughs> I can see really it nice. I'm still so, so I, I think zoom has the 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 ever worst user experience ever Anyone yeah, but you're one? you're fully covered in uh, heart emojis and ah, yeah, no, I got it. <laughs> yeah, then we had so many great uh, comments here and feedback as well. Lots of love, amazing presentation. Thank you. Um, yeah, and yeah, I'm, I'm lots and lots of great advice. Um, I do have a few questions here if you're up for it. Yeah, sure. I had no idea if I was in time. Uh, we're all good. Um, there's lots of questions here. So okay. um, first, a lot of people have asked if they would be able to have access to the presentation. I'm sure. Oh. Yeah. OK, that's that's yeah. excellent. Um, cool. And there is a question here that I'm particularly interested in the answer as well. What 
automation opportunities do you see for system dependence? Sorry, for systems depending on contributors from consuming teams. So I think this is for design systems that are made out of you know contributions from different feature teams rather than a core team. Yeah, this and is this is yeah, this is one one of the hardest questions you could ask. Um so so um um yep from my experience. In my 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 former company, this was one of my most um, most discussed um, topics. So, how can we make consuming product teams be able to contribute ex actually? And it was always um, it was always um, super hard to to realize that because of yeah of 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 programming abilities uh, of, of designing details what very good helped was um, we made up a, a a public figma board in in our figma environment where you could just simply throw in your contributions so saying oh, i would like to have this component in it in a design way um, but there's no automation effort yet to 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 be honest, uh, what I can see where you can easily contribute on on such things, uh, not in design and not in code. Yeah, no, that that's for sure something that would be a game changer. But perhaps there is something there on automations in a shared place or automations on collecting feedback from from different teams somehow uh, an easier way perhaps than sending out a Google form. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so my 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 super uh, my my um, example I I always loved is um, coming. So, so I'm coming from this um, not one product company. So we have many products. We had many products, and in the future also we will have many products uh, facing. And if you are seeing some sister products uh, uh, um, one to each other, uh, one go doing uh, uh, user feedback in. I, let's say Italy, and the, uh, the, the other team is going to Poland uh, and doing user feedback. Both are asking this, uh, similar target groups on navigation. Uh, but uh, the first, the Polish people are saying, okay, I like a top navigation. And the Italian people are saying, I like a left navigation. Both co are coming back, um, um, doing the right things. Um, and uh, implementing the top and the right navigation, uh, top and the left navigation, and then it's 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 been shipped. And both applications are shipped to the, exactly the same company uh, 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 um, countries in Italy and in Poland. And, and the Polish people are saying, "Hey, why didn't you implement the navigation as I liked it?" And the Italian people also, yeah, because it's it's both in the market. So um, um, it's what i want to say with that is it's so important to put your user feedback in at um in in one place so put it in one place right above navigation and put your user feedback in and talk about that so this could this is easy nowadays so so use i don't know um gyra and 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 confluence or use notion or use um I don't know, SharePoint, Teams, whatever, but it, this one place is, is important. So knowledge management in one place. Yeah, no, those are really, Was really good tips. <laughs> uh, no, but we, we got really good insight out of that as well. Um, there are a few questions here around uh, design ops. Maybe I can ask you okay. one yeah. of them that looks great. Um, so how do you obtain or how do we obtain alignment and communicate value of a design system and design operations to dev developers and stakeholders? Yeah, to yeah, to stakeholders, this is the ever everlasting question. This is the evangel evangelistic uh, question. So so how to uh, to to make them aware that the design system is valuable? Uh, you, you can you can come with uh, some numbers. I had them last year in my presentation. If you are looking onto the the YouTube video from last year, there are some numbers. Um, so you can convince them by saying, "Okay, we are getting faster. We are getting more uh, slower, uh, faster time to market." 
um, less redundancies, uh, less less in development time in, in means of iterations, less uh, 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 double work, whatever um, uh, you could name. Um, in the end, it's also a question of better quality in front of your customer. <laughs> so as a, a better customer experience above those touch points you have. Um, this is the most important uh, argument, I think. Um, and uh, the, 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 the hardest one to communicate because the, this is so indirect yeah so if you are doing uh, if you're crafting a design system uh, your clients are the developers and the designers and the product teams and not the end customers so so you are you you have to argument it in an indirect way so you cannot say okay through my work the end customer is getting a better cx um, because you are not run you, you don't have a, any relation to the end customer so in the end, it's so important to partner with those product teams again. Um, so you, you could set up a, um, a, a joint uh, KPI system to, to measure if your components are performing well and uh, bringing a better customer experience. So the, the communication and also the, the, the relationship to those product teams is super important. You're not just selling something to an uh, um, unknown audience. You're selling something which you would like to have a partner in. Yeah, that's a, an excellent point and an excellent call out, even partner, uh, you know, having that partnership with the product teams and potentially aligning with their KPIs. Yeah, the, that's a really, really good um, suggestion. Thank you so much. We did have a lot of questions here. Um, maybe yes, if you yes. jump into Miro and just Sorry, ask me, maybe... Miro, just ask me on LinkedIn. I'm 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 hearing uh, the the LinkedIn messages. Um, uh, <laughs> Off <already>. enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for for the great presentation and for taking the time to answer the questions. I will, I will create a PDF out of the, this. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Thorsten. You're welcome. Uh, you, you've been speaking at our meetups and conferences, but you're dropping so much knowledge. Thanks so much for sharing it with our community and hope to see you soon. Every time again. Bye, Thorsten. Bye-bye. I'm staying here, okay? Yeah, sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> we are now going to, to launch our kit. We are going to present a headless UI kit, a super advanced kit with part by some features you have never seen before in Figma. Mm -hmm. Mr. Biscuit, are you here with us? Yes, I am. Welcome. So before, it's a big launch day for us, right? Super yeah. exciting. Uh, I'm sweating because we are finally, finally showing the world what we have been working on. And Mr. Biscuit is, is a legend in the Figma community. You are the creator of so many plugins. You're the creator of the Aunt Figma UI kit. It was the most voted Figma UI kit, right? It, it got more votes than the material design UI kit. Yes, I am surprised. That's <laughs> Absolutely sick. So before before we showcase or you showcase Unstyled, I just want to mention that we have a raffle going on. So I will quickly share the mirror board um, and you can win a free copy of Unstyled. We will give it to two people, but you need to help us a little bit. So please, during the presentation, post on LinkedIn, post on Twitter, uh, use the hashtag unstyled tag into design systems. You can also tag Mr. Brisket so we find you. It's this posted here. I will just try to lock it. Please don't delete it. So please help us spreading the word on social media and we will give a free copy to two people. And also we are live on Product Hunt. So if you have some time, please upload the kit. All right, so before, before you demo all these cool features, let's think about how all of this started. 
So what I remember is that as a freelance designer, like I said, I did a lot of migrations and I thought this is so time cons consuming. It's kind of stupid to, re to create the same components all over, all over again, just for another client with a different style because the skeleton was kind of the same. If you think about an input field, you have this text field, you might have an icon. It's the same, but in a different style. So it takes a lot of time and it's also super expensive. So I remember when we created a super complex table component and it took us days. Right. I think it took us two weeks. But then if you like showcase it to the stakeholder, look, uh, we have created this amazing table component. It just took us two weeks. So if you like calculate the cost, so the business owner might think, okay, so if the hourly rate is, I don't know, $100 per hour. Okay, so now I spend 10K just for this table component. <laughs> Amazing. That's kind of, I don't want to say stupid because some people really enjoy crafting the components, but it's a lot of repetitive work. I mean, I kind of stuck in this, and this loop of creating components and refactoring components. Because once we have created the perfect component with outer layout and all the settings, there will be a new feature like component props. So you will find yourself again refactoring the components. And then there will be native design tokens in Figma soon, hopefully. So you will find yourself again refactoring the components. So um, I think this should be. Um, we need something to, to um, speed up this work so um, folks can focus on different areas as well, like accessibility, UX design, motion, design system documentation. There's never time to do that because we are always like doing the component work. So right. it's time to show the world what we have been working on. And I'm so happy that we met and that we have worked on this headless Figma UI kit. This is the most advanced Figma UI kit you can find on the internet, <laughs> on this planet. It is featured by a lot of your custom-made features and it is powered by Token Studio. A huge shout out to Token Studio X Figma tokens for supporting us with this kit. Are you ready? Yep. Super, okay, super. let's do it. All right. So, oh, I'm going to share my screen first. Yes. Yes. The, the stage is yours. Enjoy. And thanks for presenting this. I'm really proud of, of, of this kit. Um, I really love it. Yeah. So, Hello everyone, uh, I am Mr. Biscuit. Um, a fun fact about me is that uh, my avatar actually doesn't match my nickname, <laughs> but uh, that is because like I, I changed my avatar like four or three years ago. Initially it was like, um, if I show you, um, the slides are done actually, we don't need more slides. Um, my my GitHub actually has my my old avatar. It is actually a biscuit. So <laughs> I, was, I was using this avatar when I first started using Figma. You will remember my this avatar from me in, in the old uh, Spectrum form that we were using before we um, transferred to Discord. So I am also working at Jill with Tolsten and uh, yeah, if you if you join us, you get to work with me and Austin. <laughs> um, I'm super excited to be. Uh, so my my title there is called um, consultant design system architect as well as designer coder. I have been creating a lot of uh, automation plugins for Figma. I am super deep into aut automation and. Uh, um, I have also published a lot of open source design libraries. Uh, one of them is called uh, Design Open Source, and it like 
it has previously mentioned before by Sylvia. It has been voted to be the best UI kit uh, for Figma 2022. Um, I am super surprised about that. I told no one that the kit is out and, and I want you to vote. Um, but then it, it turns out that a lot of the uh, giants like uh, Microsoft and Google didn't get the first place. I, I, I'm super surprised. But um, yeah, that is the power of open source and devoting something to the community. I love the community. Um, yeah, let, let's talk about the exciting stuff. Uh, the, the reason why that we are building a style um, is, is because like we have this repetitive creation of design systems for our clients again and again. And when Silva told me about this, I thought mm, that maybe that it really is a pain point. And uh, I am in the position to solve that. And so I thought, okay, uh, why don't I start putting all my knowledge and, and cram them together into forming the best kit uh, for everyone to start building their own design systems. So first of all, let's talk about auto text color, shall we? Let's, before we, we uh, before I forget. Um, so as you can see, like currently the background is uh, yellow. And if I change that to another, another color, it's going to decide what color it will best fit for the foreground color, depending on the background color. So if it's a white background, then it will show black color. If it's a, a other color background, it's going to show different, you know, uh, foreground color. So this is um, auto text color. And, and that um, <laughs> on stereotype, that is going to uh, the, uh, when when we combine the auto text color with the power of tokens, that is on fire. I'm um, sorry, not this one, but uh, okay. So we have here um, a set of tokens that I've created and we can toggle it between like, uh, if you have the pro version, you can toggle it here between dark and light. And of course, like you can, you can see it uh, applies the changes everywhere on all the components. And um, not only that, um, but also like if we change the primary color from this color to let's say uh, a pink color of well, something like that. Okay, let me remove this. And then I hit save and then you can see that it gets applied everywhere. And if it's, um, if it's a lighter color, for example, a childish pink, then the the text and the icons on them, you guys they they will be black. <laughs> well, this is not the best color of choice, but uh, it's it's Pascal, but it it shows the power, right? Um, <laughs> if uh, if you you only have to decide your primary color, and the foreground um, knows how to behave itself. So and so on top of that. Um, not only it uh, works on black and white, but let me show you the uh, true power of uh, auto text color. Uh, this, this technique I've actually learned from Steven. Um, and so, so this is uh, uh, not my original creation, but I, I think uh, one thing that can be improved if I want to improve it is to also automate the colored auto text color. Now this is currently black and white. It only goes from black and white, no matter what background I give it, uh, this is uh, white and now this is uh, black. And so if you think about it, right? So since it already knows how to behave like between uh, black and white, how to, how, how to um, best present itself, this way, then why don't we just utilize the uh, Figma's uh, new uh, property ch chain or link feature uh, and to create it, uh, create a content out of it and just maybe call it text and have the, have the value linked between two different uh, text layers and position them uh, on top of each other and have the top one not using the auto text color, but actually using a, a, a primary color if you're choosing. For example, uh, something, probably something like uh, a blue. 
um, I randomly picked this color, but uh, and then set it to a opacity of probably like uh, sixty percent or something. And guess what? Like since these two are linked, the same content. So like if you right now, if I lock the um, bottom layer, the this uh, whatever I put in the uh, foreground layer will be uh, synced across these two text layers. And since um, this um, auto text color layer knows how to um, use the, the best contrasting color, then we get this result. So like um, if we are on a light background, it's going to have this color. And if we are on a dark background, any dark background actually, and then we get this color. And trust me, these two are not the same color. Let me pick this color from the black and let me duplicate that and pick the color from white again. So you can see that on white, it is actually using a darker blue and on, on black, it is actually using a lighter blue. That is exactly what we want when we are building the color logic for any design system. You really want the um, the foreground color to be lighter on dark and darker on light. So, so this is it, it works on all the colors effortlessly if you if you want to create it this way. And so that is the true power of auto text color. Not only I'm not lying, like uh, not only work on blue, right? <laughs> like we can change it. I'm confident it changes any color. Let's uh, let's change it to blue, and I'll copy this hex code in case you you think I am hiding something from you now. Like, okay, this is the same color, but right now, like here, it is uh, this darker one, and here it is the lighter one. So yeah, this this is the power of auto text color, um, and that automates uh, all foreground colors. So whether it's colored or uncolored, like black and white, so that alleviates a lot of the pain that you have to do in, in in the tokens and another thing while we're showing the tokens right so i want to also show you the ability to toggle the sizes using tokens of all elements now not if you if you look at um some of my elements that i put here they are all the way deep uh nested instances um like all of these are actually instances if, you, if i give you the x-ray look of all the components you can see they're all purple that means they're all instances so by definition you cannot actually change the width and height of any instance layer nested inside of another instance right but um this is this is doable um i i think I, because there is a hack that i figured out how to do it and if we check the small token here um you can see that everything starts to utilize the, the small, uh, both the spacing and the, the text. And so if I check uh, large here, and you will see everything uh, turns from default to large. Uh, give it a second, it's still running. It's getting larger, right? So like everything, the spacing, the font size, and also the icon. How the heck did the icon get larger <laughs> and the avatar, right? Let, let, let's let's focus on the icon, the avatar, right? Like fonts are easy, so, uh, paddings are easy, but what about those icons and avatars? What is going on with them? Like if I set to small and then you can see that is definitely smaller than before. This is definitely smaller, right? What is going on, right? Um, so I can even make it smaller, right? It is not, this is definitely a lot smaller, right? So like you have different sizes for each and every single component. I see people implement the sizes for each and every single component. No longer, that is all gone now, if you know this technique. Um, but this basically what it's doing <laughs> is that it is uh, composing with a resizer component that I created. The magic lies in the resizer component. Um, wait, let me, how do I get the top thing off? All right, let me just um, um, uh, show you the resizer, right? Um, okay, so it's in the miscellaneous, the last page, and it's super simple. This is the resizer. Uh, it is actually using a absolute wrapper to grab onto the 
the parent and the parent is the one that actually is resizing and so whatever instance that's inside of the um absolute wrapper is also grabbing on to the absolute position and so that it is able to resize itself so let's put it into action you can actually um compose it with whatever you want and one of my favorite uh, is to compose it together with a uh, text component and so like you can see that here is my text component and that I composed it inside of the resizer so I can put whatever inside of the resizer but I want to show you this this is cool because like I get to decide however many of lines I want so how many lines I want to display here one line two line three lines four lines five lines six like i you you can change it live like without ever detaching the instance you can see how deeply this instance is nested but you can you can absolutely change the size of everything that you see now this uh this year it's a image component i have also composed it inside of a resizer so without detaching I have to tell you, right, this image is actually living inside of the least item. It is not outside. It is inside. So nested deeply inside right now, I can still change its size and see how everything else uh, um, respond to the, the, the changes here. So this is um, breaking the limitation that... Uh, you know that you 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 cannot change the width and height. So how to do it very accurately? Um, it's it's that uh, for example, right now if you see the size here, let me. Uh, um, yeah, so, so so if you see the size here on this image is one one two on the width and height, but you see the padding is fifty six and fifty six. This is not very accurate. But if you actually uh, times by two times this number by two, you get this number. And so to make it more accurate, you actually want to if you're using tokens, um, you want to set the right and bottom value to zero and in the token you only care about the left and the top padding and that gives you the exact width and height um so so this is like harder to to tweak manually but the goal is not to tweak them manually but to use tokens um so so that is the the flexibility right here we can really compose it with whatever let me show you um uh in in uh real practice right so if i grab out a a logo whatever uh and this logo let me oh it doesn't show the layer which layer i'm selected so here i build an automation uh, uh plugin just to in this case right if figma doesn't show me where my layer is i just like for example i just press the the key and then it show me it's here this layer and so um yeah yeah so you can see right, right this layer uh, it's not really resizable. If I put it inside of any instance, this uh, width and height is no longer resizable. But if I um, put the resizer here and the resizer takes in a leaf, so uh, it's just to, to say children, right? So if I put this inside of the resizer, mm -hmm. and then now all of a sudden, uh, it is resizable. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that it's set on fill for the width and height. And so all of a sudden it is resizable. Like it is going to grab onto the resizer itself. So whatever, how how, how many um, layers deep you actually nest the resizer, it doesn't matter. Like it is resizable. Uh, it, and that is also uh, working on both the, the width and the height separately. So like you can, you can imagine on table columns, on whatever that you want to resize, you can resize them finally. Um, that is a, a, a some a very crazy idea that I just came up in my head. Um, and so that um, with that out of the way, let's talk about some of the more serious stuff that consumes more brain power. And I was lying that we are running out of uh, PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, I have some slides. I, I it's, not, it's not like I'm lazy. I didn't do any slides. But when we are creating a design system, right, starting to create a design system, everyone starts to build buttons, right? 
buttons. And so after buttons, we build the checkboxes, the switch, the input, and these, I call them the atomic components or atoms, if you will, um, so because that they can no longer be divided into smaller pieces. Like if you, I don't know, get a knife and cut in half of an input, what do you get? That is nothing. Um, if you like tear apart a button, what do you get? Like a text? How is that? Like, okay, that might be useful, but generally the definition of a atomic component is that it's no longer divisible. If you divide it, it will be no longer usable. So this is um, this is Brad Frost's, uh, I think everyone knows the, the um, atomic design methodology. So we have atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, pages. And then if you ask any product designer, they will tell you that atoms, molecules, and organisms, those are the job of the design system. But if you ask any design systems person, they will tell you, hell no, I only care about atoms and molecules. Organisms is never my thing. We, we don't do organisms. They, they are the product designer's job. And so, you know, what is, so in the end, who whose job is to build the organisms? That is a question. And this leaves ambiguity in the communication between the team. So I actually um, came up with a, I think a more granular or, or better terminology, let's call all of the right side higher order components that will clarify things a lot. Instead of atoms, molecules, organisms, those on the right side of atoms are all higher order components, meaning that they consume components. As long as a component consumes other components, it is a higher order component. Uh, that makes things very clear. <laughs> and so, for example, right, we have uh, from top to bottom, we have a list item, a input field, and a, sl a slider. Now you can you can think about it like okay, so the input field is consuming a label, a helper text, and in the center is consuming a input or a drop down, right? So okay, so that's why they are defined higher order components. Um, but in higher order components, there are still two distinct groups of them. This first group, I call them partial specialization group of higher order components. The reason being that they have a well-defined structure and most of the elements are controlled by the design system, but not all of them. If you think about the first uh, example, right on the top, you see the list item. So in the left side, we can actually put avatars or images or, uh, I don't know, like uh, icons. And on the right side, we can put an arrow pointing to the left when the user click on it, meaning to uh, drill down to the detail page, right? Or we can have like a button, uh, whatever. This right here is putting a counter here. Uh, but okay, but that you can see the structure is there. The divider, it's always starting after uh, the avatar or the uh, artwork. So this is like part of the components are not decided. They can be specialized to the specific immediate design needs, but most of them actually listens to your design system. You have control over most of the elements. But if we take a look at the second example, right? We can say like uh, we can have uh, in the center a input, a drop down, uh, or, or or a select even an upload, whatever that that user can input, you can put in the center. Think about it, right? So this is how many uh, components do you have to build uh, to suffice all of the different variations, right? That is astronomical because think about checkboxes in the center. Um, you have also sliders in the center that is also possible upload. Um, for so many things, right? Uh, that you can put in the center. Um, so and so this is why it is called partial specialization. In the center, there is a slot, um, or in the in, for the user to put whatever they want inside of it, right? So the third example, the slider on both sides. Currently, it is showing icon. 
but it is also you can also imagine that it being viable to put numbers there the left being zero the right being 100 that will also be viable um variations are limitless don't limit the designer's capability to design let them do the design but the third um category is even higher than this um this higher order component um level it is a higher higher order component but it is also a, it's also a higher order component but it's called a container component now think about um this a uh, timeline right so or or or, or steps uh, no matter what you want to call it right so instead of the steps right it is just the container the steps itself doesn't really have any structure and it doesn't really have any inherent elements of its own uh of itself like it actually displays its children that is called the step item or the uh, timeline item so currently on the screen we have two timeline items the first one and the second one you can see that the, uh, both of which are uh partial specialization components so I, I can show you live in code uh this is i'm actually using this example from uh, uber based web and you can see like currently there's just the children and if i if i cut out the children there's nothing like there's just nothing and this shows you that it, it really is just a container component um so like I can also decide to, okay, let's not have the button. And instead of two steps, let's have uh, three steps. How about that, right? Three steps. And then, but if you think about, okay, so if it's just the container component, what's the usage of it? Like, why don't I just use a plain frame, right? Or a auto layout frame instead of putting it a component? Why do you have to create components for the sake of creating components? Many people have that doubts in their heads, and that is normal. Um, high order components, right? Especially in the highest level, in in this container level, they do not inherently provide structure, but they actually get to legislate. They actually get to decide what the children uh, is looking like. This, so they exert their control not through visual elements, but through their child components. So if you don't have this a container component, then you will miss a lot of the, the control when, when it comes to code, when, when it comes to actually implementing the thing, right? So this is like, I can select the first one and the second one. So this is all controlled by uh, the container component itself. So another example, uh, I'll show you more visually, uh, both in code and in Plasmic uh, is the same, right? So here I have form control. Now, if I delete all the child elements, uh, you can see that it really is just a container. It doesn't have anything. It doesn't have styles of its own. So, but if I put everything inside and there's a form label, there's an input component, there's a helper text component, then everything starts to look like, okay, a form control. But the power of the form control itself, right? Being the higher order component, is not to present the visual elements inside, but to, to decide how they behave for example if i put it on disable if i put it on it's invalid you can see that it's both changing the label and the input here and not only that i as i said before like this is currently input but you can actually put whatever inside let me delete it and let's put a select and that is also uh, part of the uh, sub components that are designated to be used inside of the form control. And you can see if I turn on disable or it's invalid, it also uh, affects this select. So no matter what child components you put inside of there, if it is known previously, if it is known by the form control, it is able to exert control to, uh, over all the child components themselves. So you can think about like size, uh, states, whatever. Uh, there's so many things that the uh, container component is good for and the methodology um that uh how you piece everything together is is actually uh something to think about so we will i'm seeing a lot of people using base components right so um here is a chart um so you know that if we want to inherit some value um 
uh, or, or function from one component to another component, you can use it as base and nest it inside of the other component, right? And then so we don't have to repeat uh, implementing the same feature again and again and again in every single component. So this is like, uh, this is a, a good thing that people are thinking about it, but it is not the best because like, okay, so let's think about it. What do the bike and motorcycle have in common? People can write them, right? So I don't implement the right function in bike and a motorcycle separately. I implement it there in their in their ancestor. Uh, that is the, the two wheels subject. And uh, and the, the terrestrial objects have the ability to roam on land. So this also get implemented to cars. And so all the, the uh, vehicles can turn around and, and fly the other way or, or, or move you the other way. So that is the uh, attribute of the vehicle itself. So this is actually object inheritance at play here. And so if you nest uh, or, or use base components uh, that you are really um, trying to not to repeat yourself, and that is good, but somewhere along the lines, it, it, it fails to achieve its goal to not repeat itself. Because if you look here, right, um, on the flying objects, okay, both the um, helicopter and the jets are, are, are a few a consumption vehicles and but the cars is also going to consume fuel and the motorcycle is also going to consume fuel do you want to put them uh as as children's uh of this tree to, to but no because obviously they cannot fly uh, and so this is where it starts to run into the problems right so uh, we know that a jet engine is using uh uh, uh, sorry, we know a jet is using a jet engine. We know that a propeller doesn't have the jet engine. So that's why we need to create their functionalities differently, distinctively. But if we are talking about a uh, M1 Abrams tank, where do you want to put it? This thing, this dude is also using a jet engine. That is probably the most sophisticated component inside of this vehicle. Now, do you want to re-implement this by putting it under the probably the, the tracked thing uh, to have it inherit these abilities? Or do you want to put it under the jet to inherit the jet engine so you don't need to implement re-implement this again? Neither is it good because the tank cannot fly, obviously, right? So you will always find yourself having to re repeat the, uh, doing the same functionalities here and there if you're using this methodology. So what I propose is rather than object inheritance, we go for object composition. So composition is really what makes un unstyled unstyled. Um, so we get to piece components together like Lego bricks to form uh, new components that we don't have on hand as product designers, because most of the things inside of a higher order component is not really definable uh, before uh, they are actually being used by the product designer. They have like their immediate need. I only have five minutes and I need to um, create this component right now. Well, Good luck. Like if your component design system is not really composable, they can really just detach them and detaching your component, meaning that your design system starts to fail. Right. And so, but if they don't detach, they will have to file the, um, like the, um, the need upstream to the design systems team and the t design systems team have to spend like three or five months to, uh, develop that new component for the consumers to use. Right. And that is, it's not very good. Um, so this is why uh, composability is the future of design system. Let, let me show you what I mean by composability. Right. So, for example, right here in this uh, drop down, I have uh, this many uh, number of uh, components inside of it. And if we turn on instant geodos, we can um, suddenly just uh, yeah, I automate I automated this process as well. Like before, we have to change the drop down, but no, like we just need to uh, hit the plus or minus button to get more or less items inside of it. And so, if we decide, okay, this is the number of uh, slots that I want, and then I just paste them, and and voila, you're here. So, 
Yeah. Um, th this is composability. Like the, you, you don't, really, I, I don't have thousand variants like for, for this drop down and deciding like however uh, number of items it has inside. But instead, instead I am using a, a composable concept called mutable slots. Yeah, let me really just show you mutable slots and how it works. Um, so if I turn this back to its original form, uh, do I really have to? Okay, so let me turn this back to its original form. It looked like this, right? So it's a vertical of eight slots inside of it. You can see there are eight leaves. So, but inside uh, of each leaf, I can also decide whether I want it to grow horizontally or vertically. Um, and so this uh, this is like, uh, okay, the first uh, uh, node is like one slot and the second node I've increased it to four or five slots, right? And so you can also um, choose any of the uh, end nodes and, and change them again. Like if I want to, them to grow uh, vertically or horizontally again, you can do, Whatever you can think of, the, the layout possibility is infinite. Um, this is uh, mutable slots uh, on fire, uh, automated by by instance utils. Um, so this is um, uh, really the core concept that you, you that product designers don't have to detach your components. They can compose the components that they want themselves. Uh, if they really don't have it, right? But most of the times they will have something similar to what they want already existing in your design system. They just, they just need a little bit of tweaking and you want really to give them the ability and trust that um, they really have just five minutes <laughs> to hand over that uh, to developers and, and they cannot wait for, for five months uh, for you to implement that to your uh, in your design system. So. Um, another, the final thing that I want to talk about in this, uh, that is very powerful in this kit, right? Uh, it's uh, the ability to have uh, absolute position layers everywhere that you want without detaching. Um, so what I mean by that is that, uh, okay, let me, instead of large, let me put back to normal. Um, what I mean by that is that, uh, take a look at this, uh, uh, Mr. Dylan Field right here, right? So with all due respect, um, if I if I change its uh, size, um, you know that uh, there's a badge on the right uh, hand corner, uh, top right hand corner that is uh, actually just floating there. It's not part of the auto layout. And so it is absolute position. Um, so this actually is not only used here once, but it is used everywhere. Like you can, Think about like you. If you hover on on a button, uh, you will have the tooltip, right? And this is popping out everywhere. And um, if we're talking about like um, sliders, you you want to show sometimes uh, the percentage of the slides. Uh, uh, and and so really, absolute position is used everywhere. So like, um, I, I I have the the absolute position ability implemented to slots so uh i can turn it on uh just, just like that and then i can say that okay i want this position to go to the right side and offset also to the right side and so now i can start turning this one because it is composable at its core into a vertical of uh, let's say four and then I can just paste in all these uh, to to create like a, a sub menu, um, like something like this. Um, like okay, so yeah, just copy and paste, and then auto layout, right? So um, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just the auto layout and make it like that, and some radius. So. This is powerful, why? Because um, everywhere that you really want to use uh, absolute position, you don't really have to re-implement that again in your component. So none of this component, none of these components have the um, like absolute position uh, capability of their own, but this is like a, um, a one stone to kill all the birds together. Um, and so if we, uh, I'm really proud of this uh, example here. Um, this is, of course, I, I made better styles than the one that I just made. So um, this right here is where 
this second level pop up is uh, positioned upon. And so I, uh, you can see like uh, the concept is actually quite simple. This is a previous version, so it doesn't have the property. So the position decides in general, what position do you want the uh, child element to be? And the offset is deciding, okay, where do you want to offset it to? Um, so you you can put it like on the right side or on the left side, you know, depending on where you have more screen real estate. So yeah, that that, that is that is super uh, helpful to 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 have this. Um, and and when it comes to composability, like this entire tabs uh, item, it's actually just this. Uh, and you can see that okay, so it only has the text inside, nothing else, and there's no there's no like uh, thousands of properties to change. Like okay, one slash, two slash, three slash. No, this is just by text, and then you get to compose it to to whatever you want. And of course, your tokens are supposed to remain control over, okay, how the paddings is going to work, what is the size of the fonts inside, the size for title, the size for body text, and all, all those in the colors, right? Um, tokens are supposed to lock in the, the styles. If you don't trust your product designers, but I think they are, since they are designing some other products, you might as well just trust them that they're not going to make stupid mistakes like we uh, constantly assume. But give them the tools to help them achieve what they want to build quicker and uh, more of course there are there can be human errors sometimes i'm not saying that it's not going to happen but help them right help your product designers to alleviate the pain of having to like do so many nitty gritties and, and let them use tokens to to like boost their productivity um and so this is uh, a a really uh, unstyled, what it is, is a uh, starter kit or boilerplate for you to build your um, future-proof design systems. So um, it has all my um, uh, recent and best uh, practices packed inside of it. And there are tutorials that I am constantly updating. So like if you have a file, you don't need to um, re-download the file again, it is live updated because all of these tutorials and tips actually live inside of another document. So I'm going to push inside of this document and you will receive the updates because I know that people are not going to want to constantly download another version, another version of the library because they have already built a ton of stuff in that library. So no longer, you don't need to download a uh, hundred versions of the library and re-implement everything. Um, yeah, the library is live updated. So uh, with that, uh, let's go to uh, end this uh, talk. Um, so some takeaways, some takeaways, right? Uh, first of all, do not repeat yourself, right? Don't implement the same feature again and again in, in, in every single component and uh, prefer component composition over inheritance for higher order components, especially container components and uh, tokenize the size and paddings like because okay we, we have the resizer now you can change the size of instances um so you don't you don't you, you no longer need to implement the size properties for each and every component anymore that is autom automated and so for higher order components they are meant to serve a different purpose their purpose is to regulate their child instead of like directly presenting visual elements that is the job of atom uh, components atomic components right so um i i hope you guys enjoyed this talk and and learned something together with me um thank you for your time and you can find me on mr biscuit Data design i love you guys uh, until next time um have a good one bye bye so much mr biscuit that was an impressive demo yeah we're all in shock here someone asked actually <laughs> asked if anyone knows how to reattach your jaw because um ours is on the floor <laughs> um yeah so yeah so much positive sentiment here in the chat so many um minds blown <laughs> blown away by the demo we have so many questions are you up for a few of them yeah, definitely okay amazing so lots and lots of questions around the autocolor 
and I'm actually very interested in this one as well. So someone actually made a comment, assuming the auto text color accounts for the accessibility ratios, or is yes. that something that still needs to be manually tested? Okay, so it works like this, right? Um, <laughs> you, you might be also wondering like how to implement the thing in code. Uh, so in code, like, we, can uh, we can check the contrast ratios between the foreground and the background. You will get a number back, whether it's like if it's smaller than 4.5, that means that it is no longer uh, uh, sufficing the 3A, the AAA, um, uh, you know, uh, criteria then you will need to swap it to like a different uh, opposite end of the, the other uh, end of your color spectrum. If that is white, switch it to black, black switch it to white. And so that is actually what uh, the auto text color is doing as well in our Figma file. But of course you don't need to implement the same uh, color style in, in code, but in code you are actually going to do the uh, foreground background checking. So that's how, and it's super easy. There's a library for that. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay, yeah, that that kind of answers another question here that was uh, voted by a few people. Um, how can autocolor be implemented on the dev site? This uses blending modes, and does that translate in dev? So you kind of answer that. Uh, that that's something that it's already been it's already been done on the code side of things and we just didn't have that in on our side yeah right. but that'd be right yes yeah. amazing we are hanging behind the code we're trying to catch up <laughs> <laughs> always um so there is a question here which is a more i guess um around the more of a practical question, I guess. Uh, will the colors use the pro features of Token Studios um, or if or having the pro version of the Token Studios is a, a, a requirement for, for this function to work? Oh, definitely not. Like most um, functions that you will ever use in Token Studio, they do not require you to have the pro account. What uh, circumstances do you want to have the pro account? That is when you have um, so, you know, you can create sets of tokens, right, in Token Studio. And if you have like 100 sets, then you probably want to better manage those 100 sets and, and e easily switch between. Because right now, you are actually checking the check, ticking the checkboxes on and off and on and off. So the pro version allows you to do that uh, quicker. And so that is like mm, more productive when, when you are super deep into uh, the world of tokens. Otherwise, you you're just fine using free version. Yes, everything in Unstyled is built for free version. That's really great to know. Um, there is a question here around using slots in components. So, how do you give access to properties set in the components used in the slots? Do you use nested instances, or and and the question around um, if that causes clutter? Uh, or if it clutters the usage, I should say. Okay, um, so you can choose to expose um, certain uh, so certain components as properties through the the slots, right? The, so that you can on on the outermost component um, or the parent component um, adjust them adjust these properties together. Um, but if let's say you are talking about like 10 input fields, then that might not be a good idea. So US design system implementer, you actually have to call on which component I want to expose to the parent, its property, which I do not want to expose. And, and the, on those that you do not want to expose, I, I suggest that you have you, you, um, you implement a hitbox so that the user is able to directly uh, tap into the component itself. Um, more on hitbox uh, in in the, the file itself. Everyone can check. Amazing, <laughs> thank you. That was uh, some of the questions here. It's obviously uh, the features and the case are very new, so um, you might not even have all the answers, but it looks like you do have it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Super. Lots, lots more questions around um, auto color here, but maybe I can ask you one last, um, which is around uh, would would the auto color then make 
the token sets for say dark mode or the text color for dark mode redundant? Um, hmm. That actually depends on how deep you are using the, that is actually something that uh, it's in the experimental phase actually, because uh, Unstyled is supposed to push your thinking forward uh, instead of like using all the existing technologies. Um, so as design systems teams, right? If you don't go forward, uh, then don't expect your product is going to lead uh, the trend. So um, that is not actually going to work uh, super well together with uh, the uh, tokens plugin currently, maybe in the next version, right? We're thinking about it, but currently like since it is blending mode and tokens do not yet uh, support blending modes, then you, I am just using it as a style. But if you don't like the uh, the idea of the auto text color, you can just use regular uh, tokens, and uh, and that will solve the problem. Yes. Right, right, right. I think the question was around. Um, well, no, that's perfect. I, I just mean I don't think it's either one or the other. Um, it's more about you know will eventually um the auto text color replace the need of I guess having to set a separate color palette for for dark mode. I think maybe down the line, um, mm-hmm. it it it'll, 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 it can generate automate that process. Mm-hmm. Um, amazing, Sylvia. Did you have a question that you want to ask? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much, Mr. Biscuit, for this impressive demo. I don't have a question, but I have a wish, if you still have some time. Because I, in the beginning, I've mentioned that it took us days, if not weeks, to create the perfect complex table component. Oh. Do you have some time to, to give us a demo how to modify a table component in the Unstyle kit? Because I know that we have an, a cool example. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I forgot to show that. Um, sorry. Yeah, let's let's go back uh, and then let's show the table component. Now it is nested deeply inside of other instances again, um, but uh, we know the pain uh, when it comes down to adjusting uh, tables, right? So I, I made uh, the functionality for it specifically, and it's called row table setup. And if you click on it, mm, wait a bit, right? The plugin is, go- is going to crunch uh, the table and then it's going to spit out a new table for you to be able to directly uh, like just 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 drag and drop uh, the, uh, the the columns. And then you, if you like, you, you say that I want this to be uh, bigger or smaller, like all the columns will, will, you know, all the cells in the column will follow. And if, uh, if one, uh, one of the cells is bigger, then the row will grow. You can see, right? The row adapts and the column adapts as well. So this is like never before achievable. And if I want like, for example, right now I have four columns. I have, I want five columns, six columns. You can have that. And the issue is that, uh, okay, you may want to also uh, fix the the headers. That is probably the, the only thing that you need to do. And then voila, you're done. That, there's, that is that easy. And so... Um, let's delete these two. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, let's delete the uh, let's delete the controller wrap. Right. Whenever you are done with uh, the table, you're happy with the table. Let's delete the controller wrap, because the controller wrap is supposed to serve as uh, the master control of your entire table. Uh, it is discard. It is uh, discardable after use. So, like when you need it again, you can press on the rotatable setup, and you will get your controller back, as so as to not clutter up your design. That is only its only purpose is for you to quickly um, control the table. And since this is deeply nested, it, it, it took uh, some, uh, you know, time. Um, but like, okay, this, these uh, cells uh, inside, they are also customizable like uh, and composable. Like if I just, uh, instead of two uh, vertically, I, I just want one, so I minus a slot. And then you can see, okay, so all of the columns, uh, column cells uh, adapts accordingly. And so you can essentially just control one thing uh, and then have it, um, 
replicated across the entire table. Uh, this is the power of it. And then you, after you're done, discard the controller wrap and you're good to go. Awesome. Thank you so much. So it looks like with a few clicks, I could have created this complex table component, which took us days. We understand that this kit is something new. It is advanced. There are some new techniques. We have implemented some tutorials. We will uh, share and record some more tutorials for you. It is something new. It is like there is not such a kit out there yet. It is not a standard kit where you have a bunch of components with styles which you can copy paste. Um, it is a completely new way of creating and modifying components. And we have just launched the kit today, so we are still working on it. And we'll be shipping updates once there is native design tokens in Figma. Um, we will implement them, of course, in the kit. So there will be a lot of updates. And where can people find more about this kit? Mr. Okay. Um, you can go to unstyled.design. I bought that domain yesterday, and the website is up. So uns, let me spell it in the chat. Unstyled. Wait, I always I always misspell. Okay, unstyled. Um, hmm. It's unstyled.design. Right, that design. And everything is in lower letters. So, so do I. Lower letters, yes. Not capital. <laughs> <laughs> I want capital letters, but that doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, go to this site and um, you will see more information. Later on, I will post more, um, more tutorial videos as well on this site. Awesome. We also have a Discord channel. So if you have any questions, um, join the Discord channel. And yeah, I'm super happy about our, uh, about our launch. It is uh, something completely new. This at once. It's like learning about design tokens and implementing them. It, took, it takes some effort, but I think it's a really cool way to uh, modify and create and style components much faster than before. Thank you so much, Mr. Biscuit, for joining us. And you will be also joining us in Madrid in person, right? It's yeah. uh, May 9th, and you can find the link to the event in our Miro board. Um, so we will uh, meet at Salonis in Madrid to see Unstyled probably updated or like Mr. Biscuit in person presenting Unstyled. We will see the guys from Salonis and we might also see folks from Panpot. Panpot, the, the new design tool, open source design tool. They will also join us to present in person. Wow. Awesome. And we will also see you at our online conference. So um, we have so much knowledge to share. Um, so you're hired a speaker for forever. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Biscuit, for sharing your knowledge with our community. And see you soon. See you. Thank you. Bye. Awesome. That was a great meetup. It was amazing. And I think we all shared the excitement of the same excitement excitement that Mr. Biscuit had uh, demoing that. We're all here like, yay, tables. <laughs> yes, he's so deep into, into this Figma kit stuff. I think he knew some more about Figma than some Figma employees, probably. He's the real Figma, Figma wizard. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. So should we wrap up the meetup? I think Maybe so. Once again, share our mural board. So a lot of people joined us. Unfortunately, we fucked up a little bit with the mural board. Um, but yeah. Um, a lot of people from all around the world joined us. Um, 
you can see here, please feel free to connect with people. This should be also a networking event. So many people posted their Twitter handle or link to their LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out to these people. We have shared some resources and we have told you about our, about our upcoming events. Uh, so we'll have one at BMW. This one is in person. We will have one in Madrid. And we will have our online conference coming this summer. Very exciting. Yes. I also, hope I can make it to one of the in-person meetups as well. Yeah, that would be amazing. And the cool thing is that Andressa will be also one of our hosts of the online conference, which I'm super excited about. So also the speakers dropped um, some links to the presentations. They will also come back to this board to answer more of your questions. So um, feel free to check out the mural board. And we got some really nice feedback here from you as well. Awesome. Yeah, lots and lots of great feedback and positive messages there. Great to see. Yes. Feels like I need to take a day off to process all this, <laughs> all this knowledge. So after each meetup or conference we do, I feel like a complete noob. <laughs> So I need to relearn everything. Um, but that's so amazing about our community that there are so many people willing to share their knowledge, which is mind blowing. And we are Absolutely. constantly trying to push the design systems topic forward with some future proofed content and to see how design system people are working in a day to day life. So we can take something out of it and implement it in our daily work. I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much, Andresa, for joining us. It was Thank a you. pleasure to host the meetup with you again. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, we hope to see you next time again. Have a wonderful day, morning, evening, wherever you are. Um, and thanks so much for your support. This community is really, really special. Um, there are people joining all of our meetups. Um, I can see in the chat that there are people like they've been joining uh, all of our meetups for years. That's super impressive. We, we really deeply love this community and we can't wait to do more events for you. Amazing. Thank you. Ever Thank you so much for having me again. It was a lot of fun. And thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. And see you next time. Bye bye.